Oh, are we doing that right now? I forgot. We don't have we don't have to recap the plot, do we? Let's do it right now. That's a, I think I love this idea. Yeah. This is Auteur Detour, wherein three film lovers travel through the filmographies of cinema's most important directors in hopes of finding a greater understanding on the other side. Hi, welcome back again to Auteur Detour. We <laughs> thought it was uh, important that we um, address the black and white elephant in the room, which is Joel Cohen apart from his brother has come out with a new film. And, um, as your source of all things, Cohen brothers, uh, it was our duty to kind of, uh, watch the movie, give you our report and, uh, talk about what this means for the Cohen's career, the future of this, uh, you know, incredible collaboration. So Joel Cohen directed the tragedy of Macbeth. I believe it's based on a play. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's of course based on the famous Shakespeare play. Uh, a dude, a thane, gets a prophecy from uh, three witches, sort of, um, and it tells him he's going to have all these great things happen to him. He's going to eventually become king. And when the fortune starts coming true, his kind of ambition takes hold and he begins like basically a murder spree to get into power. And uh, it all leads to his eventual undoing. Um, hence the title. And that's it. You probably know the story a little bit, or at least like a dozen or so of the most powerful lines, which have mm-hmm. all become like uh, famous expressions, titles of novels. It's it's pretty incredible actually to listen to the dialogue and be like, damn, these are some these are some bangers. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh and and the movie itself, of course, I think um stands with uh a lot of their other great films but what, what do you guys think how'd you guys like the movie loved it loved it oh my god well i love shakespeare i mean i'm not a huge shakespeare like the whole canon but macbeth of all shakespeare which i appreciate macbeth is hands down my favorite uh, of his works and it's just great uh i was kind of hesitant at first given the fact that it's in scotland yet starring an african-american you know man specifically denzel washington here which i love i love seeing you know black faces in in cinema but i don't like love when they're kind of wedged in there in a a place that doesn't really kind of fit totally works here don't even care it's amazing that looks fantastic um i love the black and white i love the kind of um, a soundstage look to it, which totally mm-hmm. differs from the actual onset location of the most recent Macbeth version, the uh, Justin Curzel directed version with uh, Michael right. Fassbender and Marion Cotillard. Uh, Did you see that version, Chris? Oh yeah, so many times, so many times. Oh, really? I love that version. <laughs> really? I mean, it may or may not be people's favorite. Again, Shakespearean language. It. Watch it. it. It's awesome it's way better than assassin's rick, creed with rick the same two bats. people in it. <laughs> no it's great and that's kind of what i was uh holding it up against almost because i really really love that version when i saw it so i'm like okay let's give this one a shot and it's so different and it's it's excellent it works really well there's a few little things i, I didn't care for too much about it but I, I was blown away by how just beautiful it looked how well it worked and there's the power of certain scenes and the visual imagery that was done that set it apart from most other versions of Macbeth that I've seen uh, really work for me. So I really enjoyed this film. I don't know about you guys. Okay. Awesome. awesome. I mean, not as much as you, but I did love it also. Like, I, I feel like visually it was incredible. You know, the acting was incredible. Like, I, and it's Macbeth and that's incredible. Like, you know, I'm not going to like uh, say anything against it in any of those ways. I think for me, at a certain point, I had to sit back and, you know, this is my fucking podcast brain going for sure. I probably wouldn't have had this if thought if we weren't making the podcast. But I started just kind of being like, what are we doing? Like, what 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 was he doing making this movie? Like, why... <laughs> And I don't know, like, what? it didn't feel like, really? I just meant like, what are we doing here, Joel? What are we doing, Come on, what are we doing in my life making movies? Like, what I mean uh. is that like, besides how beautiful it was and how well acted it was, like, it just felt like, I mean, I don't know. It felt weird to watch him just film a stage play. Like, I don't know. That's kind of. So it's interesting to hear you say this because that. like, I mean, it was so different than 
any other film he's ever made. So yeah. different. And like, he, I, you know, I don't, I didn't have time to, oh, actually I just forgot that we were doing this, but um, uh, I did, I didn't look into like what the budget was for this movie, but, it, but um, my understanding of what, how this kind of came to be was that Frances McDormand was in a play of Macbeth and she played Lady Macbeth and she asked Joel if he wanted to direct the play. And he's like, I'm not interested in plays. But he went and saw the show, of course, and then and he, and he was kind of so fascinated by this kind of pared down style of the play that he's like, oh, shit, you know, this gives me an idea of how I could make this kind of cinematic. That's really interesting. And then and oh, and then. Oh, go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, idea. because that's what it felt like to me was like, what if Joel Cohen had directed a play? Like, that's what it felt like to me. Like, even though there was plenty of stuff in this that you couldn't necessarily do as well on stage. No, no, no. Yeah. But, it was, to um, me, it felt like it didn't feel like a play or a movie it felt like tv it felt like Mm. this could have been like this is like it reminded me of like when they used to do uh like in the 50s um when they would do like these incredible like uh hour-long dramas and stuff on television and they would be filmed by like you know john frankenheimer and stuff like that Mm. a lot of like the amazing uh 60s kind of like most radical visually uh 60s directors came out of 50s television and uh like requiem for heavyweight and uh and stuff like that and um that's what it felt like because it felt like low budget it felt like uh like really beautiful and beautifully filmed but not but um not really cinematic you know and the fact that it was made like to stream you know i was like I'm I, I'm watching a TV show right now. And there was one transition where like a mist blew by and then it switched from one scene to the next. And I was like, that was literally like a 90s PBS transition. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like this feels like British TV. And uh, and I loved it. I, I thought it was like, this is rad, but like, this is not a film. You know, it really felt like, yeah. like similar That's... to when I watched like uh, The Irishman. I was like, this is not a movie or this is like, this is like a weird, like hybrid mutant child, splice child of like That's the right. new digital era. And, uh, and this seemed like, but I, I felt like only positive about it. Mm-hmm. I only felt positive about it too. I didn't even mean it. When I say not as much, I just meant like, I was like se- separated from it at a certain point while watching it. Like I wasn't completely drawn sure. in and engrossed the whole time. I kind of actually wished it was like, I was like, it, it, keeping on the TV theme, I was like, I wish that I, there was like, this played over two nights with two hour long uh, episodes. You know what I mean? I was like, I could have been, because that's so does, much language to take. Yeah. And it's such a, it's so pared down. Mm-hmm. It's so just like watching actors in front of like a blank wall. And there's so much language to like kind of process as you're going. I was like, I could have totally, I think I might've consumed it more easily spread out over a couple of days than just like watching it as a movie. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I also think I would have consumed it better if it was in the big screen, even though it wasn't cinematic. But just mm. you know, it was. It did feel like a show, like you said. Like a, it was also you know, in four three, which is what part of yeah. what uh, you know made that. And so, like, just feeling. the act of like streaming it on my TV during the daytime, like I just that probably didn't help me to get engrossed in it as much. I was going to say the format, the fact that we're not in the theater really watching it may have mm-hmm. actually contributed to that experience. You know what I mean? The totally. Dreaming totally. nature. Yeah. I actually was really impressed though with, because if you read Macbeth, it's largely a uh, monologue. There's a lot of just monologue, monologue, and that can be really, really damaging to a movie, right? If you're just sitting there mm-hmm. watching someone just talk, right? Uh, and that's yeah. why I think the Curzel version worked so well for me. And I was kind of like, I hope he does something like well with this one, which I didn't have any doubt it's joel but it's it's mm-hmm. smooth he, he picks and chooses the lines correctly such that it's never droning uh the way they're delivered is really naturalistic it's not this like bombastic sort of like kenneth brana bravado kind of right, like portrayal like right. you know even though you have this guy with a kind of new york accent playing a scottish king it works you know yeah. because he the lines are crisp <laughs> it's nice and narrowed down denzel washington is but- so fucking good <laughs> like he's the best movie star i don't know like he's just it's got great. he's fucking Macbeth is like a perfect coen brothers movie in a way mm-hmm. and it's also a perfect but it's also a perfect denzel part right like i mean i was like making parallels between like this and like man on fire and like uh, you know american gangster and like you know what i mean like it really uh but i like how he plays it like less powerfully than like so many of his other performances. Right, you know what I mean? Right. Like he's just more like a dude who's just like, 
I could be king. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's such a good choice to just like focus on like the faces of Francis McDormand mm-hmm. and Denzel mm-hmm. Washington. And, and so, I mean, so many good performances in this movie. Brendan Gleeson. Incredible. Oh my God. Uh, a witch lady. I loved him Amazing. So much. The, witch, the witch lady. She's, she's in so She's haunted dead. my dreams the for best. like a night or two before that. She <laughs> starts off all contorted and like, what is this? Was that yeah. really her what? contorting? Or yeah, was that I, think so. trick? I think so. That was incredible. And that then, was incredible. Well, I love the, uh, the treatment because you see a lot of different portrayals of the witch, which is one of the most like compelling characters, you know, in cinema. Yeah. Uh, the Kurosawa yeah. version, Throne of Blood, it's just one. It's one person, yeah. you know? And that's really an interesting yeah. choice. Uh, and, you know, the other one, there's three different ages of late ladies, like a little girl. There's a middle, like medium aged lady. And I've seen like a really old one, you know, the three sisters. But this one's really mm-hmm. cool. It's like the same person, just like a mirror. And there's that yeah, shot in the beginning yeah. of one person in, uh, standing yeah. in front of a pool with two people mm-hmm. split, you know, mirroring that that image. I uh, fucking loved that. that really cool. Really and then, of course, that, <laughs> that shot where uh, she's hanging from the rafters, basically, and the, the, the cauldron is the floor. That's a great great touch mm-hmm. I, he's kind of yeah. got his feet in the water like that's the cauldron that's a really brilliant coughed uh, up the baby finger. oh my god oh. <laughs> or baby i mean that actress whatever. like who's an english stage actress and has been in you know harry potter speaking of alfonso Cuaron and like other things you know just like english movies like bit parts mostly mm-hmm. like she must have been like holy shit this is the part i was born to play and i get to play it in a fucking coen brothers version of like Macbeth. Mm-hmm. like how what a fucking treat for her and she killed it like i don't know i really feel like um again there were a lot of interesting artistic choices um it didn't feel like as indelible to me or as like iconic to me as like a lot of um, Coen Brothers films. It did feel like just kind of like, you know, you're making like a TV special that has to go on in a month and you're like, what if we did this cool thing? Okay, let's try it. Let's try That's, it. And I, and I, totally and I felt like, he was, it right and I felt like, like I, he was kind of like, you know, really taking some swings, but like unencumbered by the fact that he was, he was the sole director on the movie. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, uh, you know, the fact that there was like both like, a, a, like a looseness to it, but also like an ambitiousness to it, but also it could just be like a, you know, a white wall with like a single shadow crossing behind the, the character, like because he was just doing it by himself and it wasn't the two of them kind of going like, and then this, and then this, you know what I mean? Like I felt like there was a, both an ambition to it and a, what am I trying to say? Like a modestness to it. That was like, um, it felt, I don't know, like it, it felt like the work of somebody, like a really confident artist who was just kind of like on his own for the first time, mm-hmm. just like throwing stuff out there. Man, I missed. I don't know. So it was, it was interesting to me as a, a singular Cohen movie rather than like a Cohen brother. I was watching it trying to figure out what was missing without having Ethan there, you know? And it was hard to. It's, Nature? You know, well, the like, language a lot of the yeah, time, occasion. you know, with the Cohen brothers, it's like Ethan typically does the writing, right? So, I mean, when you have mm-hmm. that writing that's supplemented with something that's literally word for word, something that's already been, you know. I think that they have kind of it's been said about them by all the people that work on their movies that they kind of do everything together though like even though ethan gets the white writing credit and joel gets the directing credit a lot it's pretty much a 50 50 split on all of it like that's what i've heard at right? least from the actors but um personally when i talk to them um, <laughs> yeah it's not what ethan <laughs> told me but whatever <laughs> <laughs> but no um and yeah, I think that's that's what the main thing, but Travis, that you said, like the nature of just that, like, there was like a, you know, again, it's hard to tell because it is Shakespeare play, like, and that's already going to keep you a little bit at like, or at least keep me a little bit at like a studiousness, you know, yeah, in a yeah. weird way, like, you know, so it's hard to know, but like, it is, it was less exactly what you said. I'm fucking stupid. <laughs> I have a question for you guys. So Chris, you brought up like there is this kind of colorblind casting to this film. And we get and so we get to see this amazing Denzel Washington performance, like in a part that he's basically like worked his whole career to like, you know, kind of nail this kind of performance. Um and so that's like, you know, unequivocally like just great, you know, like but it is interesting to me that this is the first Coen Brothers film where you have a black main character Mm -hmm. and it's a film that's totally. um, And I don't want to say that like it's ahistorical to have black people in like medieval times or black people like in England, because it's not like that's kind of a a thing that a lot of those kind of movies uh, um, overlook, but that's not what this is, right? This is not like, Hey, let's look at history like through like uh, actually a more 
a, a realistic lens, you know what I mean? And, and give it like kind of the color that it was always there. This is let's just cast whatever actor we think would be good. And so you get like a, a mixed race cast. But it is it does sort of feel like not like I, I'm not questioning the like the world of the film, like the choices of the casting of the film. But in terms of like the Coen brothers, it does feel like a cop out like, oh, now we can use black actors because we don't have to think about it. You know what I mean? Right. And maybe that's like maybe that's good. Maybe that's what they had to do to like allow themselves to cast black actors but like uh because well, it's not just denzel washington like other no, characters no, that's what i'm saying and like all you see all these great actors and you're like oh i know that guy like i love that guy like uh and um who was it like i, I always get the names confused but duncan or Bank condor one. or some two which one guy. the king oh no yeah not the, the wife when they go to meet the wife and i just like right. love the wife's performance and i was just like lady um, macbeth lady Macduff. no <laughs> <laughs> no I, they all have i don't know some some uh scottish person but she was played by a black actress, and I was just like, "Oh, McDuff's wife, yeah. yeah, yeah." So I was like, "She's great," and and it, like it's great that she's casting this movie. And I was just like, I just wondered if you guys had any thoughts about like, wow, they had to literally like get completely outside of history to to even to cast like black actors in their movies. And I just thought it was kind of like, uh, I guess that's I maybe that's all I, that needs to be said. But it's just sort of like, yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know what I, I mean. Did you like I think did. about that at all? You know, because this has been your kind of like drum that you've been beating. I did, that. of course, I did. I didn't really know. <sighs> I couldn't really tell if it was like. I mean, is Ethan the racist one? <laughs> <Just> <laughs> no, but that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think it was. I don't think it was like they obviously like uh, like you know Cassie Denzel Washington. Like, of course, it's like not even a question. But like. It, they didn't have to stretch their imaginations to do it. You know what I mean? Whereas in the other movies, like right. the, the, a lot of the characters that are played by uh, actors of like uh, other than like white people are like, oh, well, because this guy is kind of like, uh, you know, like the Native American guy in Fargo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this guy lives like on the periphery. Well, and, and, I guess I didn't answer your question because well, that's my joke. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, well, their, their blackness is actually stripped down in this movie by virtue of their structure, right? The structure of the play. They don't have to write, like, what a black person would sound like or talk like. That's, or what, I'm like. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, the lady, lady killers, killers was, the, was like just the worst. Exactly right. my point, you know? And, <laughs> but, um, right, exactly. Right. But I, I just okay. felt like, I mean, first of all, because I was going to say, I didn't answer your question, but, like, I did love that. Like, I loved to watch them... And just movies in general, like acknowledge the fact that black people exist. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it, it was, it was nice. Like and right, I was, I was on board as far as like trying to parse out how much of it was them doing it consciously because they've gotten criticized for it so much. Like that was my questioning, obviously not with Denzel, but with, you know, the other characters was like, they have come under a lot of fire They've said some stupid shit trying to be like, obviously this is just Joel here, but together they've said some stupid shit being like, you know, why should I care about that? Basically, like mm -hmm. when, uh, when Hail Caesar came out and it had a cast of 75 and there was zero black people in it and people were like, you aren't allowed to do this anymore. Like, stop doing it. And they came out after that in this interview and were like. Uh, well, no, like, I don't care about that. Like, I'm just making movies. Why would I care about the black experience in 1940s Hollywood when that's not the movie I'm making? Um, and, you know, we've debated whether there's any validity to that at all. But whether there is or not, I had to wonder watching this if they're like, okay, we have to do this now. Or if they're right. just like made aware of it, like you said, like if they're just like, I don't know. Or maybe okay. they're was, actually like, now we can actually finally do this, you know, without I like, can do it. Right. I mean, I, I can see well, as yeah, being a realm writer without trying to stretch yourself too crazy to, you know, I'm just going to stay in my lane, write for who I know I can write for and then keep it that way and hopefully leave the other roles to other directors and whatnot that are better at this than I am. Uh, maybe right. they're like, finally, now we get to do this. I, I want to believe that was the case with this movie. <laughs> I want to, totally. I don't know. Uh, either way, I'm glad it happened. Uh, I love this movie. Thought it was great. Um, I don't know when I'm going to see it again. This is one of those movies. You know, Shakespeare <laughs> uh, is not always uh, like, the, let's just throw this one on again tonight. That was amazing. But um, I'm glad they made it. I'm glad Joel made it. I'm really intrigued to see what happens next, though. Right? Like, do yeah. are they going to be uh, like a Wachowski deal? Like, both Lana and Lily are now, like, you know, doing different things, I guess. Or the, the Coens now, like, 
doing separate stuff, or was this just a sort of temporary hiatus from one another before they come I back know. like Voltron it again felt, and crush but it? But like you said, it felt like it was not like a full movie, even though I know it was. Like, but it didn't feel like, you know, like a he was stepping aside from Ethan to make his like magnum opus. It felt like it was more just like, oh well, what if I film like my wife's play? You know what I mean? But make it and he's like, but sick. I'm going to make it a, like a movie, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, and Ethan was just like, no, I don't want to do that. Like, yeah. that's kind of the story behind the making of it, too, is that like the reason why Ethan wasn't on this one was because he just didn't want to be, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not like they so, had any falling know. out I mean, or anything, right? I mean, not that yeah, they're exactly, right. still, you know, brothers. And, and I wouldn't like be surprised if they. <laughs> made, no, they got divorced as brothers. <laughs> they got themselves legally separated. Yeah. The Siamese twins have been finally, uh, you know, severed from Chopped. one another. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ethan's now dead. Yeah. He didn't survive. But because of that, like, it doesn't really have a place in Cohen, like, uh, filmography to me in a weird way. Like, maybe it will down the line after I've seen it again in a few years or something like that. But, like, it kind of stands apart in the same way that, like, Ethan's books stand apart. Like, we didn't talk about the fact that, like, Ethan has written several books, like... Like, we didn't talk about that through the whole Coen Brothers series because they don't really feel like part of his filmography. And because you know? I don't read. I can't read. Right. I just watch. That's why I watch. And this movies. feels more along he those likes the lines. the pictures. Way. Yes. And I don't want to take anything away from this movie because, like, I mean, by saying that, because, like, Joel Cohen's fucking a great director. And it's an incredibly beautifully shot and Again, just, made movie. just in terms of the casting, just in terms of the visuals, like, yeah. I mean, a stunning achievement. And at the same time, it does feel a little it's in this pantheon of kind of like minimal Shakespeare adaptations, which mm-hmm. is like a, a thing, you know, and, it, and it's mm-hmm. like really just like a very Versus McDormand is incredible. I was going to say, mean, it's just very much like t- a, 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 an outlet for the actors to just like, give yeah, these like great yeah. performances and readings of these watching, like iconic lines. I really love being able to go just, see uh, like a, what I felt like a Sven Nykvist uh, cinematography level. You know, like I said before, yeah. Seventh Seal is the first thing that jumps to my mind. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yes, yeah. this looks awesome. Yeah. And they kept that, that feel all the way through, especially with like, yeah, exactly. Like you said, the kind of slanted beam of light, like a single yes. minimal lighting that's very a stark contrast from one yeah, thing to beautiful. the next, you know, kind of a sweeping mm-hmm. landscape without being like this, you know. Anyway, yeah. I just art, di- art, art direction, 10 of 10 cinematography yeah. and it was great cinematography there was some like yeah it was good it was good yeah uh, great music you know acting, well. 10 out of 10 i do love that he did still use like his newer stable of actors too yeah. obviously denzel's new to him because he's black but um <laughs> but he uh, but you know besides francis mcdormand obviously who's in so many of his movies but like steven root's back oh and my henry, god when steven harry root steven shakespearean Root, steven root. Yeah. So, what and harry tra- what a is gift. fucking great in this too harry like, melling has arms and legs in this movie awesome i know yeah. it's like so yeah, yeah, steven, root, steven yeah. root just scene stealing you know fucking great performance as always he's so hammy and he like so good. lives in that fucking world i was so gonna say he fits like <laughs> somehow he's both like the most accessible and seems like the most uh in the world of shakespeare simultaneously mm-hmm. like really incredible performance well, you know, for like denzel one minute of that. screen time two minutes of screen time denzel incredible. was in which shakespeare play was he one was of the kind of brand of comedies yeah yeah i think it was in much ado okay he was also in much ado Yep. Yeah. Steven Root? Denzel was. No, no, no. no, no Denzel. Denzel was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Denzel. Denzel, of course. Yeah, yeah. I remember that movie. God, I always get that one in Midsummer Night's Dream confused in those that era of what? movies that came How out. How dare you? But um, because which one had, that's the one that also had Michael Keaton, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. And that was the role that was like the Steven Root, like suddenly fucking like Keaton comes on screen and you're like, Oh, we're back in the movie again. <laughs> like, you know, like he's got this like and Stephen Root did that in this movie where it's just like you get a little zoned out watching these Shakespeare things and then a character comes in and you're like, oh, this is fucking my guy now. <laughs> like, yeah, sometimes like I don't know this if this makes any sense or if this but like it's easier for me to imagine being drawn in to the story sometimes if I'm thinking of I'm sitting at the back of like the globe theater, watching these people from like a great distance, sometimes when they're like in your face mm-hmm. and you can see every like crevice of their of, like lighting on their pores at watching them like spew this dialogue. It's somehow like I want to back away. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, the dialogue is so timeless and sometimes it feels like um, 
it's like almost a mistake to put it to film, even though I love some Shakespeare movies and uh, I love Throne of Blood, actually. That that's what this was missing, like a giant arrow uh, fight at the end. Totally. Um, and uh, do you guys have like any favorite Shakespeare adaptations? Because I, I do love Shakespeare. I have like a weird uh, love of Shakespeare. The Lion King. Duh. I wouldn't say that's a weird thing. <laughs> I think most people like Shakespeare. I don't know if they do. I, I feel like I don't I don't know. I, I like Shakespeare. Yeah, he's a good guy. But it doesn't really, but it doesn't really like necessarily. There's not like you know. I don't like. I don't know. I like it. I do want to see like a modern, really good Midsummer Night's Dream because it's so weird. Okay, you Midsummer Night's. Oh, so, so actually, my favorite adaptation of Shakespeare on film is Midsummer Night's Dream. There's a 1936 version, mm-hmm. James and, Cagney, and with James Cagney, and like uh. the, it's like a, it's got like all these. It's got um, oh gosh, Dick Powell. It's got um. I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but like a, uh, a beautiful young uh, lady whose name I forget. But anyway, uh, an incredible like, cast. And I for years I saw photos of it. and I was like, oh, my God, it's like Warner Brothers doing one of their like screwball romantic comedies. But uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream. I'm like, that's like mm-hmm. so perfect. And then I watched it and it doesn't really live up to that. Like the dialogue is delivered so over the top, like mm. trying to make you understand what they're saying. Uh, to the point where you feel like you're being like beaten, like bludgeoned with mm-hmm. it. So it, it it's sort of a missed opportunity. And yet the most gorgeous cinematography to yeah, come out of the 1930s Warner Brothers, like yeah. uh, stable, like it's incredible. In fact, there's an amazing story. The guy didn't get nominated for uh, best cinematography, even though he basically invented this technique where like he films all the kind of mystical stuff behind this kind of sheen. So it's like, you're like glimpsing in to the like fairy realm, like through like the veil, like uh, beyond like the, the regular actors. He didn't get nominated for the Academy Award. He won as a write-in. The only time that's ever happened oh, in, in uh, Academy Award uh, history, and they made it against the rules the following year. So it was like wow. a, a one once in a in a <laughs> Academy Award history that it, that happened. But uh, nice. it's a beautiful film. It has some yeah, incredible beautiful. acting in it. Puck is played by uh, Mickey Rooney, in, mm-hmm. and he's like literally one of the best performances I've ever seen in my life. It's incredible. But um, so much like beauty in that movie. The, again, like the pinnacle of like the Warner Brothers, they put all this money into it and apparently audiences hated it at the time and mm-hmm. it's not thought of as like a classic movie now, but if you go back and watch it, it really is like yeah, beautiful. Great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Ron That's is good movie. too. Ron is good too. Yeah, it is. Great call. King Lear doesn't get a lot of love. Shakespeare, uh, what's it called? Romeo and Juliet by, uh, by Bosler. Oh, Bosler. No. Bosler. <laughs> Bosler. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> hell like yes. Oh. Love it! I love that one. What are you talking Good about? God, no. are you guys not Baz Luhrmann? I liked it no, when I when came like out, Baz and Luhrmann. I think I saw it again. Oh, I, like, uh. I love Baz Luhrmann. Never better than um, what's it called? Uh, Mulan. The Rose. Uh, no, the dancing one. Uh, Strictly Ballroom. But I also Baz- love Great Gatsby, and I love Moulin Rouge. That's insane. Those movies suck. Mm, I'm with you, Ian. <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you, Ian. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. What about Australia? Did you love that? <laughs> no. So I saw the cover to that <laughs> movie and went, I, I'm not watching this ever. I see like Hugh Jackman and his eyes closed next to Nicole Kidman. I'm like, I'm, I think I can skip this. I think I get I it. I thought it was going to be good. It's a, a rare misfire from Baz, but. Um, <laughs> a rare misfire? He's my guy. He's my uh, guy. Uh, Fair enough. Love, yeah, maybe I'll try Baz. it. I'll give it a shot. You no, know what's I funny? I mean, we got to get off of this. This is supposed to be a mini sound. But I was thinking about Moulin Rouge the other day, thinking about how time like flattens everything and how Greta, my daughter, who's 11, you guys know. But um, uh, in the future, we'll probably think that like if she ever watches Moulin Rouge, which I hope she doesn't. But if she ever does, she'll think that like Nirvana was contemporaries with the Beatles. You know what I mean? Like there will be no time gets flattened so much that like the context for like the 25 years between the two bands will be gone in like 30 years. You know what I mean? But isn't that so, the point like, of the movie that like this, like that these kind of timeless things, I think that's like the point of the movie that like, you know what I mean? I'm I not even know. complaining. I was just okay. thinking about okay. that movie and thinking about how weird that is. Well, well, that's the same thing cool in Great Gatsby what, too. Like yeah, Kanye West thing, is Greg, playing and like, you know, the Does the same thing 40s. with Great Gatsby? Does the same thing with... Uh, yeah, but that's different to me. <laughs> like, I feel like when he uses like Kanye and Great Gatsby, which I'm also, I should tell you, uh, did not finish that movie. I was so fucking done with that movie. So good. But um, no, when he uses that, that feels like it's like, I'm a director that's like showing, you know, 
my style like that's style over substance and like the ultimate like what we talked about with Cohen a lot you know but like in, a, in the best that, like, way in the best way again like he, i don't know to me like so, yeah I don't know. This was an off topic thought, but it was just like thinking about Moulin Rouge the other day and thinking about how, you know, time fucking flattens everything. Time is a flat circle, guys. And like, you know, it really is going to be weird when like, you know, in the same way that like James Cagney and Marlon Brando and like in like the same kind of lexicon, you know what I mean? Like, obviously not us, but I feel like a lot of people think of like old timey movie stars and they'll be like, you know, they might be 25 years apart, but like Humphrey Bogart and Marlon Brando to people. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm going like, to say some crazy stuff and you're going to get mad at me, Ian. But like Paul Newman, Sidney Poitier, these are actors that I don't care about because they made movies in like an era that like I don't like. Like all their movies are like extremely boring to me, which is like the late 50s and 60s. Um, I, I think you're right because like a lot of people like are like, oh, Travis, you love like old movies. And I'm like, not not that era. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think <laughs> right. those movies are good. Even that movie you told me to watch, uh, with the, the three wise men or whatever. Oh, fuck you. That movie was, is so good. <laughs> there's no, <laughs> no it's so boring. It's like very 50s. First of all, that was making. 1944 or something. No, like, no, 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 no. It was 54. No. Yeah. It was like, in, I think it was pretty late. It had that fifties feel, even if it was forties. But uh, how could you not like that movie? That movie is so good. I just I don't know. It was OK. It's the best Christmas movie that exists. All right. Anyway, I see Chris is like extremely <laughs> bored. Is just bored. Asleep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What were you talking about? Uh, Cohen's Macbeth. Yeah. Uh, four stars. <laughs> Love it. Five, four out of five yeah. stars. Four out of five. Uh, I, yeah, I like it. It was four cool. I, like, again. I, I would say I loved it. I just don't know if i would put it like against any other coen brothers movie let's rank them all at the top of our heads like, right now <laughs> one through 19 yeah, go yeah. no i think kidding, it's a, i think it's a different because it's a it's, different director it's a different we director. can put it to, no, you're right. to the side but you're right uh, you're right but i'm glad we watched it and it was definitely an interesting kind of addendum to the whole coen brothers uh you know season that we recorded totally glad we did it guys all right great talking to you and uh we'll be back for a full episode soon see ya Thank you for listening to Autour Detour. We'll see you again next week.